How many of you came to hear the word of God? Amen. Amen. One of the things I believe that we need to get back to, and when I say we, it's because of what we can witness at times. We can witness from behind the pulpit God's word which is holy. A lot of times we get a lot more of man's knowledge than we do God's word. And we need to understand that God's word doesn't need our help. Amen. We need God's word. We don't need to sugarcoat it. We don't need to put a little extra mustard or ketchup. It works just the way it is in the Bible. And I really believe that that is what God is looking for in this hour, for men and women to cling to the word of God, to begin to fast and pray, to begin to seek God in spirit and in truth. Amen. A church, amen, the, the church is not this building. The ecclesia of God is you and I, the very believers of God. Jesus didn't die for this building. He died for me and for you. Amen. So we need to understand that as the church, it's the time for us to come into a spiritual unity and to begin to walk in the power of Christ, in the anointing of God, not allowing anything that we see or we hear, amen, in the news to move us. We really need to walk in the power of God and not be influenced or swayed by what we see or what we hear. You have to know who you are in Christ. And the reason I say that is because I believe that this next election is going to be very important. And I will never tell anybody how to vote. But I will tell you this. Vote the Bible. We need somebody in the White House that understands that God is in control of all things. We need somebody in the White House that understands that God's word is holy. We need somebody in the White House that understands that what God created, no man can change. And so I believe it's such an important season, such an important season that we need to, if, if you're not in the things of God, if you're not in the word of God, if you're not consistent in the things of God, you're going to be swayed by every wind of doctrine. That's why there's so many Christians right now that are so confused. Because they're not in the word. When you're in the word, amen, you're fellowshipping with Jesus. The word of God is not only washing you, amen, but it's building you up and it's strengthening you, amen. Praise God. I said this earlier, praise God for online ministry. But some of the online ministries have destroyed many things. I'm going to be real. Praise God that, you know, it, when we had COVID and, and all that stuff, when you couldn't come to church, online ministry blew up. But some people never got out of the pajamas and are still at home on Sundays. Still gripped with fear with the COVID thing and all this, or, or maybe they just got lazy. Or maybe they just don't agree with what God is speaking in the house, so they begin to go online and scroll and find something that can satisfy their flesh. We use it as a tool also. I'm not saying you can't do that. But we should never replace online for the word of God. Come on, if you were here in that worship, you should be saying amen. 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 Because the spirit of God, yes, is everywhere. But the Shekinah glory of God is so powerful. And that comes when we gather together as a corporate body, as the body of Christ. Amen. And we pull heaven down together. This afternoon, I want to talk to you about something that God has placed in my heart. And I really believe that we need it, especially in this time and in the days that we're living. We have to take control, not only of our mind, but of our lives. 
I shared this this morning and it's going to come out different because we're just in a different region in a different area and I don't usually share the same message and I'm not trying to do that but huh? I thought I did something wrong amen uh, I don't usually do that but I believe that this message is so important because I believe that there's people that are stuck stuck and when I say stuck I mean stuck in your mind Stuck in your mindset, stuck in habits, amen, and even stuck in things that people spoke over your life, that those words were spoken over your life, and you're still living in a place that God already set you free from. We got to be able to pull down those thoughts and those imaginations. We have to take control of our lives. We need to understand, amen, that we cannot remain, amen, that same person. Yes, we were hurt. Yes, we were abused. Amen. Yes, we went through trauma. Yes, we went through all those things. But I'll tell you what, the blood of Jesus has set you free. The blood of Jesus has made you whole. You are not a victim, amen. It's time to begin to live your life rightfully what God has for you. We can't keep reaching back. People begin to reach back when things get hard. When it begins to get difficult, when, when breakthrough is about to take place in our lives, when God is wanting to go deeper in those areas, people always want to reach back and continue to, to live this life because it's so familiar here. That's why the disciples, when Jesus was crucified, amen, the first thing Peter said is, I'm going fishing. Why? Because he was familiar with that. But you see, you got to remember that Jesus, when he found him, he says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Yeah. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. They'll put that up in a moment. Make me a liar, guys. I'm going to have to go to my Bible here. There we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. Look at what it says next. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. To knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy the false arguments. Guys, there are so many battles taking place right now in people's minds. There's so many people right now not knowing what to do, who they are. It, it's just, it's such a confusion and we need to understand that the very problem is that Satan brings confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. If he can get you to trip, if he can get you to question, he begins to attack the very purpose of your life. We have to be able to demolish those strongholds. What is a stronghold? It's something that has been built up in your mind and you can't seem to remove it. Amen. It's there and it's getting stronger and stronger. The only way to break those strongholds is through prayer, through the word, and through fasting. And you don't just pull it down, you demolish it, the Bible says. You destroy it. Because if you don't destroy it, it'll come back and it'll, guess what? Attack your children. Yeah. That's like saying, oh, I don't drink anymore, but I'm just going to keep this bottle on the shelf here. Eventually, that bottle is going to find 
got to demolish things. There's some things in our lives, amen, things in our minds, some hurts and some things in our lives that we need to begin to deal with if we're going to walk in freedom. If we're going to walk in forgiveness, if we're going to see God do these amazing things in our lives, it's going to take work. Tell your neighbor, it's going to take work. <laughs> see, many times we, 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 we become this, this selfie generation and we become these people that we want things instantly. Nowadays, we got the Keurig coffee and we want it instant. Come on, anybody here ever drink Sanka? <laughs> Folgers, amen, huh? Right? You used to put that hot water, you used to put that sank in there, and you would be stirring that thing, and you would be stirring that thing, and man, it wouldn't break up sometimes, and you would begin to crush. But guess what? It was an instant. So we need to understand that we can't have, you know, our, our walk with God is not an instant, amen. Yes, God can transform, but it takes work. That's why he says he renews our mind. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now you notice disobedience is what God... Uh, in order for a person to be obedient, he has to be humble. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, I believe he's talking to me. If he's not talking to you, you were a goody two-shoes. But I know who I was. I know what he set me free from. I know what he's done in my life. I know that I was in the hand of the enemy and it was only Jesus Christ, amen, that came in and he spared my life, that he came in, amen, and he smacked the hand of the enemy off of my life. I know I was playing with many sins and I don't brag about it. I'm just thankful to God that he set me free. So if you were a poquito sinner, okay, this isn't for you. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. And then he says in verse number two, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil. Now notice, he's not holding any punches here and he's letting us know. That if you're not serving God, guess who you're serving? It's the same thing with the Spirit. You either operate under the power of the Holy Spirit or you're influenced by the Spirit of Antichrist. Right. And many times we say, well, I wasn't serving the devil. Well, you weren't serving God. You were serving. You just didn't know. But now we know. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. And then he says, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Huh. You know, when it becomes sin, when you know, when you know that it's not right, but you do it anyway. And I'll tell you what, that every one of us knows. We know. You know exactly when you shouldn't be watching something. You know exactly when you shouldn't be saying something. You know exactly, amen, when you're thinking certain things, amen. You, you know when you're about to go somewhere. And guess who is telling you, don't go, don't go. The Holy Spirit. He says that he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. What is disobedience to God? Anything that is opposite of his word. We don't get to pick and choose. You don't compromise. You don't cut and paste. I mean, you don't, it's not like a buffet that, you know, you want Chinese today and you don't want this. No, no, you don't just pick and choose. Genesis to Revelation. Sometimes we want to choose and we know every promise and every blessing that's in the Bible. But the ones, 
the, the things that say that he's a just God, those areas where God begins to say, hey, we need to be accountable. We need to do, you know, live our lives right. I mean, we need to live a humble. Oh, you don't. Nobody even knows where those addresses are. We got to live our lives by Genesis to Revelation. Jesus said, I do not come to do away with the law, but I come to fulfill the law. Are you with me? I'm going somewhere. It's going to take me a minute to get the 747 up. In verse 3, he says, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires. Notice, again, he says, all of us. So if you're not included in this, please come up so I can pray for you because you're lying. Amen? It's better to, to be called out as a liar and save and make it to heaven than to go all the way lying to hell. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. I love how Paul here, he's not holding back. He's letting us know that the spirit of Antichrist is at work and it's at work in the hearts, amen, in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And I'll tell you, just like the apostle Paul says, I was the chief of sinners, I was probably right behind him. Because when people would try to tell me about Jesus, I didn't want to hear it. When people would tell me about the light, I used to make fun of them and say, oh, you know what? I got a bud light. Mocking. Ignorant. But you know why I did that? Because I was scared of the truth. I was scared, amen, that I wouldn't be able to live this life that God has set me free from, this, this life of sin. I always thought I had to be a certain way. I always thought I had to come before a holy God, you know, all cleansed and, and, and knowing and, and leaving the addiction and live, you know, no longer being a pervert or no longer being a liar. I thought there's no way that I can come to this holy God. But when I read the gospel and the Bible says that while I was yet a sinner that Christ died for us, think about this. God wants to meet you in your mess. Come on, somebody. You know when Jesus shows up at your house? When everything is chaotic. And some of us were like, hold on, Jesus, I got to vacuum in it and I got to get all the clothes under the, you know, the bed and I got to, you know, put all this stuff away and I got to do the laundry. And Jesus said, what do you think I'm here for? I'm here to clean your mess. We need to understand that when you come to Christ, you come as you are. It doesn't matter where you were yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did last month. When you come to Jesus, he knows exactly where you are and he wants to set you free. He is there, amen, not only to heal you, but to forgive you. What a loving God we serve. What a good God we serve. Think about this. He wants to take my junk, forgive me, Put a new spirit in me and give me life. No one else is going to do that. And when I think about the man that writes this, he came to know Jesus very different than some of the other disciples. Can we pay our bill? I got it, Chris. Thank you. See, his cross was at a crossroads. He was at a place where he was going and he was about to do something and Jesus stepped in. Jesus steps in and he meets him in a time 
where he thinks and he knows everything. We have anybody like that in this place? Don't lift up your hand, please. Because we, we've all, I'll lift up both. Come on. I'll lie for you. Hello. No, I won't. So we were like, oh, thank you. Will you take it? No. Listen, we have all thought we've known everything. You know what I've learned? That in 20 years of serving God, I didn't know anything. And the reason that I ended up in the place I was at is because I knew. And I know I got some brother I know and some sister I knows in here too. Pastor, do you mind if, you know, I just want to share something. Oh, okay. Well, this, oh, I know. Okay, but then, oh, I know. So should I just send you a picture so you could talk to my picture? Because you know. Every one of us has had that mentality of I know. This is a man who is writing that the commander, amen, the prince of the air is Satan. And he's trying to take the high place. He's trying to take dominion over the lives of the believer. And we need to be able to pull those strongholds down, those lies, those deceptions. You have to know who you are in God. When I read from the apostle Paul and the way he met Jesus and who he was. This is not just an ordinary man. This is not like, you know, Jesus found this cursing sailor like Peter. Peter was crazy. He was from Merced. He's crazy, but not this guy. This guy was different. Let me show you what I mean. Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, the Bible says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. See, the circumcision he's talking about is a circumcision of the heart. Now, he tells us who he is, what he knows, and where he comes from. It says in verse number four, though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. He says, I was, I was talking about physically, I was circumcised when I was Eight days old, I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, a Jew, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. This man knew the law. This man lived his life according to the five books of the Bible, the law, amen, and he knew it well, amen, and this, this man that is writing to us, amen, who is edifying the church, who is in prisons, and he's writing to people from prison, encouraging them, and telling them, amen, to live their life worthy of their calling, to know and to understand who they serve, amen, here he is, this man who is, 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 built up with all this theology, all this, he is so smart, amen, but yet, look at what it says in verse number six, I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, so he thought he was doing a work for God, but he's persecuting the church, come on, that's some confusion, that's some, that, I'm telling you, we can be so zealous, and we can be thinking we're doing the wrong thing, but we're really not. The reason why is because we're doing it in our own ability and not in the spirit. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Amen. Without fault. I can't pronounce that word. A fault. Amen. But So he's saying here that he held the law. He's living according to the law. He's doing all these things. And he has zeal. 
but yet he's persecuting what Jesus died for, the church. You see, because when you're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're operating in the flesh. And when you live by the law, amen, when you're a religious Pharisee, when you're a religious folk, amen, when, you, when you're always judging and you're always criticizing and you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to do a work in you, guess what happens? You're always looking outward and never inward. This is a man who knew the law. He studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was, man, the theologian of the days. I don't know who the theologian of our days would be. But when I think of some of the, I don't want to say any names because I just don't. But men who can break down the word of God. Men who, who understand this was him and he was being trained by this man who was so smart and he was so puffed up with his pride and in his knowledge, sometimes that knowledge can get you funny. That's why we have to pray for our college campuses. In verse 7 he says, I once thought these things were valuable. He's talking about his understanding and his knowledge. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Look at what he says. Yes, everything else is worthless. Then compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all garbage so that I could gain Christ. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap. Here is this man who knows everything according to the law. But all of a sudden, Jesus came into his life. All of a sudden, amen, he is baptized by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins to wreck every plan. It begins to bring all those high things low. And this man is saying, I count it all that rubbish, amen, because I can only see in the natural. But when I was baptized, when the Spirit of God came upon me, he says, now I can see and I can understand the keys and the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Think about it. He says, yes, everything else is worthless. And then he says, I even count that as rubbish. For a man who had this kind of degree and education, amen, uh, knowing, I mean, He had to be humbled. And when I think about this, some of my favorite preachers, like the great Billy Graham, Reverend Billy Graham, amazing man of God, Charles Stanley, who's now in with Jesus, amen, great preacher. But David Wilkerson and and all these powerful men of God, the Apostle Paul would have not received from them because in his mind he knew. Whenever anyone would probably try, he would probably open up the Bible and say, oh yeah, but this, oh but that, oh but this, but there was no spirit. So when he encountered Jesus on that road to Damascus, it wrecked everything. Everything he thought, amen, because now he could see from a clear perspective. Now he could understand because without the spirit, the Bible, amen, you will never understand it. That's why so many people get discouraged when they try to read the word of God. They're trying to read the word of God in their own understanding, amen. But all of a sudden, you begin to pray and say, Holy Spirit, this is, you inspired these men to write this word. I need you, Holy Spirit, to teach me what this means. You will be begin to have revelation. God will begin to show you pictures. God will begin to give you understanding. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can teach us. So when Paul's eyes were opened, amen, because he was blinded, remember, his eyes were not only open physically, but they were open to the supernatural. He rejected the cross. He would persecute trying to kill the believers of the way because of the resurrection. 
But now here he is. Finding himself in a place where he's willing to die for the gospel, for the Gentiles, for me and for you. Put my next scripture up, please. That's not it, but it's okay. That's not the one I wanted. Um, here it is right here. I want um, Acts chapter 9, verse 15, if you have that, please. what he says. This man who opposed everything, this man who didn't agree because he thought he knew blinded he had to be helped but yet God says this go for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles to kings and the Israelites this man who opposed the things of God could be in the church miss everything if we're not in the spirit see when you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you he will convict you he will correct you and when you're down he will edify you see a lot of times we want the edification but we don't want the correction the very first thing the Holy Spirit came to do into this world was to convict this world of sin and righteousness. But yet we don't want that because that requires change and we're too comfortable with our own life. We become more familiar with the world we're so, we're, when the Spirit of God or the anointing of God is in the Word of God is being preached under the anointing of God. When you begin to get, you know, all jittery and, and you begin to get angry and you begin to want to run out and you begin to look at your clock, something is being irritated in you and it's not the Holy Spirit. Be honest with yourself and say, there's some things in my life that need to be crucified. There's some things in my life that are still not right. Why would I get so upset over the word of God? Why would I get so upset if I know the Holy Spirit inspired this word? I love how he says again in Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. Look at what he says. For we who worship by the spirit of God. Come on, how do you worship? For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in our human effort. And God used this man. This man. Some of you here, God wants to use. And some of you are probably like, wow. That he can use me. Well, let me just show you that he can. Give me a moment. Amen. Be patient with me. In the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 25. Here's another man. Maybe you can relate to him. Because when you read from what Paul just said, he was a goody two-shoes. He, he, you know, he, he lived according to the law. He didn't, you know. But how about this guy? Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is east of Galilee. Now when Jesus stepped out of the land, he was met by a man from the city of Gerasenes, amen, who was possessed with demons for a long time. He had worn no clothes. He was a streaker, this guy, and was not living in a house, but among the tombs. Think about this, how terrible, that his mind is so messed up. The enemy has done such a number on him that he doesn't even have a home anymore. He's wandering and the place where he finds rest is with corpse. That's how messed up this man was. 
So when people say, God can't use me, I'm too messed up. Remember this man. Now the Bible says in verse 28, seeing Jesus, he cried out with a terrible voice from the depths of his throat and he fell down before him in dread of terror and he shouted loudly, what business do we have? in common with each other. Jesus, son of the most high God, I beg you do not torment me before my appointed time of judgment. Listen, even the demons know they're going to hell. But yet there's some Christians in the church that don't believe in hell. And they even notice that they can't be. Darkness and light cannot remain in the same place. Notice what he says. What business do we have in common with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God. So the demons even recognizing that he's son of the most high God. You can learn some things from the demons. That even they bow to Jesus because the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 29, I'm almost getting to my point. Now he was already commending the unclean spirit to come out of the man for it seized him violently many times and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and be driven by a demon into the desert. I need to preach this right here. If you're here and you begin to isolate yourself, if you begin to separate, if you begin to take a step back, if you begin, you're already been deceived by the enemy. Oh, but nobody understands me. Oh, but nobody knows what I'm going through. I'll tell you what, you're telling me that Jesus doesn't know what you're going through? The one who hung the stars and they still hang up in the, in the skies and they still shine after all these years, but he doesn't understand what you're going through? You see, the demon begins to take you out. Your mind begins to wander and you begin to become a victim and you begin to come this poor, this poor person and you begin to, you know, go all through all these trips and all those trials that are really in your head. From the very place where you belong, the enemy tries to remove you. And then you say, nobody loves me. In verse 30 it says, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he answered, Legion, because many demons have entered him. They continually begged him not to command them to go into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on a mountain. The demons begged Jesus to allow them to enter the pigs and he gave them permission. I love this. The demons have to beg. Amen. Because they know where the power is. It's in Christ. Then the demon came out of the man and he entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake. And they drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and told it in the city and out in the country. And people came out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and they found the man from whom the demon had come out. And now this man who was streaking, this man who had no peace, this man who lived in grace, this man who was cutting himself, listen to these words, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. says, Freddie, mentally healthy. Oh my God. A demon possessed man. Not only demon possessed, a legion of demons. A lunatic. The people were in fear of him. He would shriek and he would cry at night. And they would probably say, oh, please don't come over here. Don't come over here. Please, please. 
and he would cut himself. He had no peace in his mind. But the moment he meets Jesus, he's clothed and in his right mind. The first thing Jesus did was restore his mind. This man probably hadn't had peace in who knows how long. This man probably had no rest in who knows how long. But yet, remember, he's demon-possessed, and he's got the whole colony of demons, legion. And now he's sitting there in his right mind. What is robbing your peace? What is taking your joy? Why are you so angry? Why do you think that God can't forgive you? Because Jesus can set you free. This man, this scripture right here, not because Jesus cast off, that's easy. Jesus said by the power of God. At the finger of God, he would cast out demons. But because I see this man with peace. The enemy wants your peace. The enemy messes with our minds so much. Man, he gets people to trip so hard. And we go through these battles and these battles. And man, we try to figure things out. And we allow the devil to lie to us. We go through so much in our mind. Why? Because we allow the devil. He has no access over your mind. He has no authority over your life. Now, I'll tell you how the enemy does have authority. You want to keep going to that porn hub site? And you open up that door like that? Or you want to go to the club? Amen. Or you want to keep going to the bar? Or you want to go to the smoke shop? And you don't smoke anymore? But when anytime you go by the smoke shop, you're... <laughs> you're opening up the door. So now, the enemy can come in because you allowed him in. And when you allow him in, you gave him legal access. It's like giving a thief the key to your front door. When we leave here at night, last time I went out the door, they were trying to steal Angel's bike. When you lock the door, no thief is going to be able to come in unless you give him access. John 10, John 10, 10 says, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Guess what he's trying to kill? Guess who's trying to destroy? You are responsible for what you allow in your temple. What you watch on your phone, you are responsible. What you listen to, you are responsible. Whether it's music or gossip, whether it's those demonic movies or it's pornography, you're responsible. And we wonder why people have no peace. Salvation is the greatest thing that God has given me. And the second, for me personally, other than my beautiful wife, of course, but the second thing is the peace. I was a crazy man, messed up, completely tormented. And when I, when those thoughts begin to come into my mind, you can ask anybody that knows me. The first thing I do is I lift up my hand and I look at this. Because with drugs or without drugs, I was all messed up. I was a mess. I had no peace. My, and it wasn't Parkinson's. It was just I was so messed up and so tormented. So whenever the enemy comes and he tries to put things in my mind, I say, shut up. Look at this. The peace of God. The shalom of God. Jesus set you free. You were a tripper. But today you are healed. Today you have a sound mind. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a 
sound mind. You can't allow the enemy to come in and to destroy or, you know, man, come into your home and, and cause all this chaos. And then you want to blame the devil. And he's saying, well, yeah, you invited me in. Marriage is falling apart. Children are acting up. The dog doesn't, not even the dog wants to be around you. I'll tell you that God uses dogs. My little shy, when I come home, if she doesn't want to come to me right away, I begin to pray. I say, what's going on? God, am I carrying something? Lord, let me pray again. Because dogs always, they're always just happy. They see you and they come. She comes running. And she just wants me to, you know, give her attention. And when she doesn't come, oh, wait a minute, is something wrong? Lord Jesus, did I do something? I got to make sure that I'm right. I got to make sure that where I was, I'm not, you know, tripping or carrying anything. You got to cleanse yourself. Cleanse your mind. Are you with me? How do we get victory over this? How, how do we allow God, amen, to come into our life so that we can begin to walk in forgiveness? So that we can kick the devil out, amen, not only out of our home and out of our marriages and out of our finances, amen, or upon the illnesses in our body, but most importantly in our mind. Because I want to know. I'm tired of, you know, the enemy comes in and, and he's there roaming around. He goes into your refrigerator in your head and he helps himself, amen. He, he, he goes in there and he does whatever he wants in your mind. And then we have the power to kick him out. We got the power to say enough. We got the power to say you're not welcome here. Number one, you're going to have to allow God to do what he needs to do. There's some certain things in our life, amen, that we're doing today, amen, well, that people are doing today that you can't be doing. And some of us, we know what they are. You're going to have to allow God to do the work in you. Transformation is good. Anybody ever see a caterpillar? Anybody ever see a one up close? We were in Carmel one time, and I seen that thing on the wall. And I thought, from a distance, I thought, well, that thing is ugly. And I was, I don't know what I was thinking. I wasn't, it wasn't a holy moment for me, maybe. But the first thing I thought was to smash it. Forgive me, forgive me. I know all you holy people, oh, that's God's creation. But then I looked at my wife, and I went over there. And I got close to the wall. And man, I kept getting closer. And I kept looking at that little thing. And it was so beautiful. The colors in that thing. The little antennas and the feet. And, and I began to think, wow. From a distance, how ugly this thing was. But the closer you get... We are that caterpillar. But the more we come closer to Christ, amen, some of you are flying today, amen, in the beauty of the Lord because of what he has done in your life. The restoration, the healing, the deliverance, all these great things, amen, that God has done in our lives. you got to allow God to do the work. Here's a key. If it hurts, it's good. Let me say it again. If it hurts, it's good. You can go to the gym and you can pick up that little five pound bar and you can be there over and over and over and over. And if it don't hurt, you ain't going to grow. It's when it, ah! Right, Hector? You got to break down the muscle. And same thing in the spirit. When God goes deep in us, it's like, oh, God, what are you doing? And he's saying, son, I'm getting all this junk out. 
I don't want you to lie anymore. I don't want you to cuss anymore. I don't want you to watch those worldly things anymore. I don't want you to speak like the world because if I place my spirit in you, I am entrusting you as an heir to the kingdom of God. I called you out of the world, amen. I called you out of the world and I place my spirit in you. You're not to look like the world. So stop tripping and start trusting. When you begin to trust God, amen, it's called faith. You all read Hebrews, right? Faith. Anybody know what faith is? Thank you. You know what chapter it is? She knows. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Okay, I'm done. I'm here. Ten more minutes and then we're done. I'm getting hungry. Hey, I fast all day Sunday. My first meal is not till like seven, eight o'clock. Pray for me, amen. You gotta allow God. Psalms 51, David knew that he made such a mess of his life. And he says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That meant that he was miserable. Without the Holy Spirit, amen, you are miserable. Your mind don't lie to you. You begin to trip. You don't know if you're going. You don't know if you're coming. You don't know if you belong, amen. You're all messed up and you're all twisted up. Worse than a pretzel. Why? Because you have no peace. Because Christ is not in it he says restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me with the willing spirit I told you it's spiritual baby everything is spiritual people just say oh it's not no it is go down right there to smart and final y'all know where smart and final is some of you are about to say yeah by the casino Go to Smart and Final and walk down that liquor aisle and they say beer, wine, and spirits. Don't tell me it's not spiritual. We all got that friend, you know, little Rocky. Let's just say Rocky so nobody gets upset. I used to have a friend. He was, he was a little guy, amen? Quiet, quiet guy. But oh my God, when he would begin to drink, he was mad daddy. He was dancing with everybody. And he was so crazy, he always wanted to fight. And he always wanted to fight the big people. Like, bro, come on. Like, if you're going to get crazy, at least get crazy with, we don't have to have your back here. What happened? He began to, it was in him. It's the spirits that begin to take over. Jose Cuervo, demonic. He's influenced by all these things, this quiet person. It's now a, who, wait a minute. And then you would see him the next day and he's all. Bro, you know what you caused yesterday? And you're so small, nobody's going to hit you. You got to allow. <laughs> you got to allow God to do the work. Amen. Stop running. Amen. Stop being that baloney. Amen. You know, you try to fry that baloney. Amen. I was poor, man. We grew up poor. I used to try, man, I hated baloney and spam. Mom would give us that, that government cheese that never melted and, and with the bologna. <laughs> she would put that bologna in that thing, man. You, you can never cook that thing right. You lay it down and it would flip this way, amen. And then all you put a little hole in it and it flips the other way. Ah, forget it. Let me just eat it raw. That's how some Christians are. They're not ever allowing God to do the work. Allow God. If it hurts, that's where he needs to be. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. So the word of God, when it is being preached, it goes and it pierces and it hits those areas where those demons are hiding in the bones. 
That's how powerful the word of God is. It goes in places, amen. And that's why sometimes, listen, I need you to catch this. That's why sometimes we're right there and we're like, oh, I don't agree. Or, oh, I don't think that that's true. Well, then take it up with God. It's in his word. But that word is being preached and it's hitting that demon that is getting irritated. Remember, number one, you got to allow God to do the work. Number two is you got to trust the process. You got to trust the process. I've seen so many good men and women of God with the call of God on their lives, but just would not allow God and aborted the process. And man, sometimes you're like, man, I know what God has for them. It's called pride because they know more than God. And it's going to get difficult. I'm not saying it's going to get easy. It's going to get difficult. But remember, 20, 30 years of putting that stuff in our bodies and in our minds and living a certain way, it ain't going to just happen in one day. That's why he says, bring me a minute and present your body a holy and a living sacrifice. He says, and then I'm going to transform you and I'm going to renew your mind. Proverbs chapter 3, 1, 1 through 5, we read this the other day. It says, my son, never forget the things I've taught you. You notice how quick we forget some things? You don't forget when it's paid, eh? My son, never forget the things that I taught you. If you want a long and satisfying life, closely follow my instructions. Look at what God is saying. I will bless you. You will have an abundant life, a long life, if you just remain in my word. And the last thing is, don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. The thing that I've learned the most is when you stay thankful, Stay thankful. Stay thankful to God. And he saved us. What I deserve is death. Sinner. Saved by God's amazing grace. I don't serve God to get. I serve God because he saved me. Because I love him. And because I tried in every way. I wasn't really a pill popper. Alcohol. Drugs. Sex. Marijuana. All those things. Never brought me satisfaction. And it never took the problem away. Not once did I put something in my body and look and the bill was paid. Not once did I drink something, amen, and the problem go away. You're gonna have to trust the process. Don't grow weary. Second Timothy chapter 4, 8 says this. In the future, there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness. For being right with God. For being right with God. And doing right. Underline that in your Bible. So the crown of righteousness is awarded to those for being right and doing right, which the Lord, the righteous, the righteous judge, will award to me on that great day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have loved and longed and welcomed his appearance. 
want you to stand to your feet here. I get maybe walk with me or something. Catholic Church here. I need the spirit. Her mind, guys. Mind will take us places instantly to. Instantly. Gotta take control of your mind. The devil is trying to destroy every one of us. We need each other. We need each other. We need to stand side by side. We need to pray for one another. Stop tripping that people are looking at you or people are judging you or you're not good enough or you don't belong. You're a child of God. You are the righteousness of God. You are a son. You are a daughter. And we are a family. If you feel unloved or unwelcomed here, I guarantee you that thought is not from God. You need to know that you belong. You need to know that you're in the right place. I hear people sometimes, well, uh, so-and-so started coming to the church and I never used to like them and I just think it's better for me. What are you talking about? What do you do? When you get to heaven and they show up, are you going to tell God I'd rather go somewhere else? You can't get it right in church. You can't forgive in church. Maybe they're not the problem. Maybe the problem is still in you. There can't be any division. There can't be any hatred. Are we perfect? No. But that's why we need God to change us. That's why we need God to transform this mind. It's not about the color of the shirt you wear or what side of the tracks you're on or what color your skin you are. He died that no one would perish but have everlasting life. Gotta take control of this. This is the most important real estate right here. Because if he can get this, he can shift this. And I guarantee you, if you're here and you're backpedaling or you're isolating yourself. If you're putting yourself in the wilderness, it's not God leading you. You got to get those thoughts out. You got to pull down those thoughts. You got to pull down those. See, it begins a thought. It's a thought. Well. And then you begin to put images and you begin to do all these things, these imaginations. And guess what? Because you thought it and you didn't pull it down, amen, you begin to act in it and now you can't even get out of it because it becomes this demonic stronghold over your life. And now you're living in a life, amen, where you're miserable, where you know you're a child of God. You love God, but man, you're in a battle and it's taking place. It's real. We got the power to demolish those strongholds. Not to put them away. To demolish them. To break them and to shatter them. Because if you don't break them and you don't shatter them, they're going to come upon your family. And just in case you think I'm yelling, I'm not yelling. It's just passion, baby. I'm not here to yell at nobody. 
I love you. We love you. But I know where I should be. I should be in hell. I should be dead. But Jesus set me free. And I won't stay quiet. Amen. And I won't apologize because I love him. And I'm grateful for what he's done in my life.